pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. And uh, we will um, start with, um, of course, reviewing and approving the previous minutes and uh, from the March meeting. And Dr. Humphrey has brought up a, an excellent point that I want to discuss with everybody very quickly. Um, it says, under the heading herbicide use with Steve Norsini and Rob Zinkowski, that last year the board recommended the township use natural alternatives to eliminating weeds. And I don't believe it was actually a formal recommendation. That's my proofreading mistake there on the minutes. I believe it should be stated uh, instead to say that um, the township had offered that they were using natural alternatives to eliminating weeds in addition to the current uh, glyphosate that they were using in some areas. So I will addend those, send those to Larry, um, so it reflects the that the board did not actually recommend that to the township. However, we um, reviewed information from the public about glyphosate and other um, alternatives to glyphosate for weed control. Um, any other comments on that? Uh, any other issues or concerns with last month's minutes? From anyone? No. Is there a motion to approve them with the addendum? So moved. Approved. Or second, okay. So all in favor say aye. 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 And all against, nay. They are approved, okay. And I will addend those for Larry. All right, let's uh, move to the health officer's report, please. Larry. Good afternoon to the board, um, the board members of the Board of Health. Um, in addition to my inspections, uh, on March, March the 13th, 2013, we held, um, the Delaware County Local Boards of Health meeting here in this room. Our speaker was Judy Miller from Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. She spoke to us regarding the changes in the new 2013 food code, and we asked her a lot of questions, as you can imagine, regarding dogs and outdoor dining. Um, so we can talk about that later if you have any questions on that. Um, basically, um, and she's Melissa Viscaro's supervisor with the department. Um, also, on March the 18th of this, of this past um, month, we had our workplace safety and health fair here. Um, it was a pretty, pretty nice turnout of, for residents and for um, employees of the township. Um, we had a lot of vendors, and it was a, a good affair. Um, I actually put out a um, suggestion box and I think that people are pretty pleased with this board because we only had um, one um, uh, comment, which was keep up the good work. We also had held a, every food facility in, in, in the state of Pennsylvania is required to have at least one person that's certified in food safety um, as a, and they have to be a supervisor in that facility. Um, we, we held a training here, and we were able to certify um, eight people um, in food safety, which I think is pretty good. I want to bring your attention to May the 12th. The Carol Axelrod Memorial Blood Drive will be here in this very room from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. It's a um, good opportunity for people to give blood uh, for people who need it. And I'm going to yield partially to Mr. Kane probably later. I forwarded the board a communication regarding the Radnor Township School District Wellness Committee. He was asking for participation. Um, Mr. Chairman and the board, so ends my report. Thank you very much, Mr. Dalton. I appreciate it. Um, okay. I apologize for, for missing that. On, your, on, your po on the podium in front of you, I wanted to bring to your attention, this is the season where we're getting ready to go into the warm weather and we get the mosquitoes. Um, so for residents that are sensitive to pesticides, the Department of Agriculture has a form that you can fill out, and I keep them here in the township building. 
um, for your convenience, um, where you can fill it out, have your doctor confirm that you are sensitive, and you can send this off to the um, Department of Agriculture or send it to me and I'll make sure that they get it. And you will be notified in addition to the community notification, you will get personally notified prior to spraying. The other thing that I have in my pat in your on your podium in front of you is um, uh, a handbook that I hand out to food facilities, um, employee health and personal hygiene handbook. It's a way of doing continuing education to food facilities as we do them on a routine basis. And my hope is that when I when I give them to the food safety managers, that they'll have their, each employee read it and sign off so that it's a reminder that food safe conduct is a must. And so ends my report. Thank you. All right. So we'll head into some old business. And um, I guess we can start with the um, a little bit of discussion with the board here about our um, mission statement. Uh, Dr. Humphrey, you have a uh, you had written something a couple weeks ago. I don't think we, we actually read through the whole thing at the last meeting. Um, maybe we could start with that and make some discussion here with us about what we want to kind of give as our position as the board. Thanks. Well, I think everybody got this. I, I missed the last meeting, um, and I'm not sure what, what degree of discussion was... Uh, devoted to this. Uh, the first part of it is already on our website, and it says the Board of Health advises the Board of Commissioners and the Department of Community Development on matters of public health to promote awareness by township citizens. The township's health officer acts as a liaison between the board and the township administration and reports to them on his, his activities. Then I crafted, actually lifted phrases and sentences from several uh, mission statements that I found, not just in this state, but other states, and came up with something relatively bland, but at least I think uh, covers the concept of mission. The mission of the Board of Health is to recommend prevention-oriented programs that promote and protect the health of all township citizens and to serve as an advocate and representative in achieving their optimal health. So I throw that out as something to to work with. Now, and I think that it, it does reflect what we've been speaking of in the last few meetings, kind of as a sort of the way we've, we've gone as a board, which is to uh, have these prevention-oriented programs for the, for the community. Um, and I like that a lot. Um, I'm trying to figure, just based upon my reading of other boards of health and their, and their, um, their goals, um, are there other things that we should be striving to do? I don't know. But I, I like the... Um, I like the, the, the added sentence there, I, really, I do. Um, and I think that um, you know, working, working it out a little bit to be a little bit more, um, uh, maybe, the, uh, maybe it's the, the long sentence that I'm, you know, but I, maybe we can chop it into certain sections. But I, I, I like the, uh, the ideas that are, that are promoted here. So something for us to think about and, and see if there's any uh, other input from other board members or any, anybody else who would want us to do other things. So I think this is a, a good working start. Maybe we can kind of email back and forth over the next um, month, and maybe in May we can kind of set this in stone and see if we can call it our, our mission statement. I think it would be great. So I thank you for your, your uh, work on that, Dr. Humphrey. Um, I will also discuss from um, uh, back, back to the uh, herbicide issue, uh, glyphosate or Roundup as it's called. Um, interestingly enough, a couple of days after the meeting, um, some more information had come out from the World Health Organization. Uh, specifically, the World Health Organization has a, an agency that, that um, um, researches, uh, you know, current information about chemicals and their safety, and it's called the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the IARC. And they made a statement um, after our meeting last time that basically said that instead of calling glyphosate a safe chemical prior, um, they now label it as a, uh, a probable cancer-causing chemical. Um, there has been a lot of debate since this statement has come out from a lot of different bodies about what this actually means. 
it wasn't really based, from what I'm reading, again, this is from, um, I'm, I'm reading from Nature Magazine, which is a, a respected scientific uh, publication. Uh, there is some debate whether or not this change uh, came from any new information or just came from a, a reassessment of old information. And it's unclear um, uh, whether any, it, it's it, actually it's fairly clear that there's no new information that's come out. They're just taking older studies and reassessing those and, and, and making the statement now that it's a probable cause of cancer in humans. Um, there are a lot of variable reports you could read about, about glyphosate, and I think we, I spoke of that last year um, when I reviewed a lot of the material that was given to me from the public. Um, and there are industry studies which may or may not be trusted. I, I said last year that we can't really be the determiner whether an industry study is true or not. Um, but there are also non-industry studies that, that show its safety and non-industry studies that show that it's not so safe. So I don't think that really changes much of what the township will, will be doing. However, I think that there will, there will be a lot of things that happen across the country, um, whether it's through federally, through the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, EPA or other bodies that decide to label this chemical a certain way, or it will be locally in other townships across the, the, the country that decide to ban it or not use it. Um, and I think as scientists, you have to sort of take all that information and make determinations about what's the safest thing to, you know, to do for our own community. So as more information comes in, I think we can make better decisions um, and better recommendations. But uh, at this point, I don't think there's a big change from the information I read last year, other than the World Health Organization has now um, classified it in, into a category that was a bit different than it was last year. Um, so I think that's something for us to think about for the future, and as more information comes out, we can make uh, decisions for the, for the township. Quick question, did they sure. say possible or probable? Let me see here. There's, there was two categories, let me see here. Let me see. Because uh, they were in a yeah. D category and then an E category. Right, so the latest one here was it? It is a probable carcinogen. Okay. Declares glyphosate a probable. Okay, and there is a different category, which I think is lower, called a possible. Mm -hmm. So this moved into probable. Okay. Okay. So again, I don't want to muddy the water, but I, we, you know, we have discussed before. The township has uh, come, told us at our meeting last week that they're uh, all, they're using alternatives, they're trying alternatives, and, and and hopefully we can move to that. So we're not even worried about this anymore in the future. But we will continue to watch for information. Okay. Yeah, our last report was February in 2012. So. Mm -hmm. We were basically saying we will try to follow the scientific literature, mm -hmm. peer-reviewed literature, and various governmental edicts on this. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a wise approach. Yeah. Makes the most sense for our safety. All right. Um, so we'll move on to another old business, which was the five-minute uh, health presentations by board members. And I think um, we have two nice presentations today, which I'm looking forward to. And uh, next month, I believe we're going to have um, Dr. Offit come in and give us an update on her uh, website for teens. And I believe, was it May for you? They can do May. Okay. May. May would be great. So, Dr. Leader will do an, a lung cancer screening presentation in May. And anybody else has any interesting ideas? Kind of, yep. Sorry for being late. Apologize. Um, yeah, I'm happy to do a uh, digestive health uh, and uh, colon cancer screening talk if that's of interest to the board and our township residents. Uh, and I talked to you offline about dates. That's great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. So we'll move on to some new business, and I guess we'll start with our presentations, if that's okay. Um, let's see. So, so are you going to? Is that good? Yeah. Okay, great. So we'll start uh, with Ms. Shaney with the gift of life. Okay, so uh, this was a perfect opportunity to present um, a very important topic I thought that the township residents would be interested in hearing about. Um, April is National Donate Life Month, and um, at the conclusion of my talk, which should hopefully just be five minutes, Jessica 
Pevner from uh, Bradner High School is going to talk about the um, Give the Boy Pass, so she'll come up shortly. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this important topic tonight. So the uh, Gift of Life donor program, um, there's one located in Philadelphia. Um, it's a nonprofit work and procurement organization uh, which is dedicated to tissue recovery and iBank. It was established in 1974 and it's one of the largest um, work and procurement organizations in the United States. It's fed federally designated by Medicare for uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, Southern New Jersey and Delaware. Um, it assists 129 acute care hospitals, uh, 15 transplant centers, and 42 programs, and serves 11 million people. So it's quite large. Okay, so um, there were 447 organ donors in 2014, resulting in 1,133 transplants, if you can believe that. Um, there were 2,400 uh, tissue recoveries, 2,173 cornea recoveries, and it, since 1974, um, coordinated over 37,000 organs for transplantation and um, 550,000 uh, tissue oligographs. So uh, quite a significant number, so very uh, busy. Okay, so transplantable organs that the public might want to know about um, include kidneys, heart, lung, liver, pancreas, and intestines. Uh, transplantable tissues, which the public may not be aware of, um, can include heart valves, corneas, bone, skin, ligaments, and saphenous veins. And saphenous veins are um, veins they can use in uh, heart transplantation or um, bypass, that sort of thing, the leg veins, so uh, very important. Okay, so the organ transplant waiting list. So we in the medical community know that there, people can wait a very long time, and depending on blood type especially, people can wait a significant amount of time for specific organs. But as of April 2015, this month, what we have waiting is the largest amount being kidneys. So as you can see up there, there's uh, 5,190 people waiting for kidney transplantation. Um, 718 people for livers, followed by lung, 129, 104 hearts, 86 kidney pancreas, and 47 pancreas. And nobody's waiting for heart, lung, or intestine, which can be transplanted. So we have a very large amount of um, people on the wait list. Um, usually they're classified um, in, uh, as according to uh, severity of illness, and some people wait in hospitals for heart transplants on um, bypass, you know, machines. So, uh, you know, they're classified that way. The most sick get the first uh, priority. Okay, so the facts are, if you're sick or injured, the number one priority of the medical staff is to save your life. So people need to know that. Um, if you uh, donate your organs or tissue, an open casket funeral is possible for donors. There's no cost to the incurred by the family or donor for organ or tissue donation. All major religions in the United States support organ donation and see it as the final act of love and generosity. And anyone can be a potential organ donor regardless of age, race, or a medical history. So for the public, it's really important to know how to become an organ or tissue donor. Tissue donor. So when you go to the um, DMV to renew your license for a new picture, um, you can um, say right, you know, at that time, register to become an organ donor. You can do it online uh, at www.donors1.org. And you can also let your family know. And as an acute care um, health care provider, that's come up. I worked in the critical care area many times where um, you know we didn't have a living will, that sort of thing. And if someone has expressed that they wanted to be an organ or tissue donor, we'll take um, you know, the family's uh, lead on that. So, uh, and then um, Kidney One will be actively involved and come in and meet with the family and um, coordinate care from the hospital in. So this is an example of the driver's license registries. Um, so the percentage, uh, Pennsylvania's um, in the middle here. So 46.2% uh, are organ donors in the state of Pennsylvania, 33% a little over in New Jersey, 
and um, more than 50% in Delaware. And as you can see, I think we're all familiar with this in Pennsylvania where it uh, says you can be an organ donor. Okay, so for more information, um, you can go on the web at www.donors1.org. Um, you can call the Philadelphia office and you have the number up there. Um, there's a Facebook page, uh, Twitter account, you can go to YouTube, um, Instagram, and Second Chance blog and on the site, uh, website. Okay, so any questions about the Gift of Life program? Real quick, is this the only organization involved with um, organ transplants in this region? Because the numbers just seem so far off the number of people who need them versus the number of people who, uh, the number of organs that have been donated. As far as I know. Really? What a sad thing, There's so many people who are in need. Yeah, a lot of people in need. Any other questions? I have one, Linda. Do they coordinate sure. both um, adult and pediatric organ donation, or is this just adult cases? Um, I believe, uh, that's a good question, I'm not sure. Because I would, think, I would definitely think peds for kidney and maybe heart. So I would think a combination, yes. Is there a statewide coordinating body? Oh, absolutely. The There's whole. a national and statewide. And so people so. are registered according to how severe. There's um, a code called UNIS 1, UNIS 2. Mm -hmm. So depending on that, yes, definitely. So And then blood typing, of course, comes into that. So people with more rare blood types end up um, sometimes getting organs before more common blood types like O positive can wait a very long time. And lastly, does this organization deal in marrow at all, or this is a separate? I'm not really sure about the bone marrow mm -hmm. transplant. Because I know there's, what, a, there's, a, uh, there's a separate registry for marrow. Yeah, I was yes, going to say, because so I know it was tested a few years you. back for that. So, yes. okay. Thank you yeah, for that clarification. Of life. Thank you very much. Okay. For um, so, Jessica, would you like to come up? So, Jessica is our um, student on the board this year. So one of her projects last year was doing this video. So I'll have her explain it a little more. And I'll pull it up as you explain. Okay, so the Gift of Life Family House is a, like a subdivision of Donate Life. And what it does is it provides like a home away from home for organ transplant patients and their families. So it's similar to a hotel, but the price is very, very low and reduced for people because the price for organ donation is already high enough to get the transplant and everything. So they stay there for as long as they need, really, and they are very accommodating there. And I became involved with the um, Gift of Life Family House and Donate Life PA last year through a project for um, an extracurricular that I do called FBLA. And the um, the what we had to do for this project was make a video raising awareness for Donate Life. So here it is. Life to me is unpredictable. Life is a masterpiece awaiting to be painted. I would say life is an opportunity. Life is a gift. Donate Life. PAFBLA decided to associate Donate Life PA into this year's state project. This is the Family House, a place where Donate Life PA's goals are put into action. Hello, my name is Vinny. I am the weekend relief manager here at the Gift of Life Family House. The Gift of Life Family House provides a home away from home for transplant patients and their families. So our goal is to just help relieve stress and to give them one less thing to think about during this transplant process. The hope is to raise the number of registered organ donors so that more people on the waiting list can receive organs. We visited Bremar Hospital, where a Donate Life Awareness Program was held recently. My name is Jamisha Franklin. I work at Bryn Mawr Hospital as an administrator for support services and special projects. The Donate Life initiative brought a lot of awareness. There were a lot of our staff members that was a little bit hesitant about becoming organ donors. It really took the employees away from the misconceptions that they had always believed in. We talked to Kate Leong, mother and blogger. My name is Kate Leong, and this is my son, Gavin. When Gavin was five and a half, he had a sudden cardiac arrest, which led to his brain death. And we were asked if we wanted to donate his organs, and organ donation for us was the most beautiful gift, the Gift of Life donor program. They were wonderful supports. They had all the information that we would need, and they comforted us. We have many volunteers, we have shuttle drivers, we have guests that help the operations team. Uh, we also have what we call our Home Cook Heroes program.
Jessica's being a little shy, but she won an award for, in the state of Pennsylvania for this video, so we wanted to point really that out. Good. Really good. Well deserved, Jess. Do you have any questions? What's next? <laughs> what are you going to do next? This is pretty great. It's a pretty great start. So um, in the video, um, they mentioned a Home Cook Heroes program where a team of people can go in and cook um, for about 30 people that are at the family house. And I plan on bringing friends and family and kind of raising awareness within my circle of people in the world and kind of bringing them awareness to this issue. And even friends and I have talked, like the friends I made this video with, we've talked about starting a club at school to bring other kids that we know um, into service and other things. Terrific. Thanks, Thanks. Jess. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. So I think we'll move next to um, just, we'll kind of go a little bit out of order and we'll get to um, uh, our chemical safety presentation in just a second. Um, I will discuss quickly the um, uh, issue at Radnor High School that's been um, in the news recently, and uh, there has been an outbreak of a whooping cough at the schools, um, at the high school, and I wanted to uh, address that a bit with the, with the public, uh, just to be aware that um, whooping cough is also known as pertussis, is a uh, bacterial infection that causes a cough uh, that's distinct in its sound and the whoop is the noise that's made between coughing. Um, it is a disease that has been, uh, ha has had a number of outbreaks in the country over the last four to five years, um, and it has to do a little bit with uh, a new vaccine that was, um, that was released about 10 years ago called the acellular pertussis vaccine, and the acellular pertussis vaccine is different from an older vaccine called the whole cell vaccine, which gave longer protection for whooping cough. But the whole cell vaccine had some minor side effects that were um, eliminated by using the, the, uh, the, this newer version of the vaccine, which included fevers, uh, soreness in the arm, and um, in some rare cases, some seizures. So this newer vaccine was uh, brought out, and it has, a, although it's a good vaccine, it doesn't have the length of, um, uh, of protection that the old one did. So what we're seeing is kids between eight years old and about 12 years old are, are actually getting whooping cough and spreading it because it is a very easily spread bacteria from person to person. Um, so once there's one or two cases, there can be uh, easily five or seven cases very quickly. Uh, it is a disease that is dangerous mostly to children under the age of six months of age. Uh, so we need to protect our young ones from this disease mostly. Um, so the ways to protect people would, of course, be making sure your child is up to date on their vaccine. And if you're an adult who has never had a pertussis booster, it might be a good idea also to get one. Uh, it is a um, relatively common vaccine you can find at your family doctor or internal medicine doctor's office. Second thing would be if you have a cough that is, uh, or your child has a cough that has been going on for um, a longer period of time than your typical viral coughs, five to seven days. Uh, then you should seek medical help and see if uh, your child would be tested for whooping cough and then treat it with a relatively common antibiotic to prevent the spread to other people and especially to prevent the spread to close contacts, family, um, sports teams that may room together at certain events, um, closer contacts, not just in school. So um, although um, there's no specific intervention that's done at a school for these things, I think the township has already started doing some things, meaning cleaning things well and uh, making sure that uh, vaccine records are looked over and people are reminded to get their, their boosters. So I think the township has done the right thing. Uh, the school said, I'm sorry, the school district has done the right thing uh, to keep this to a minimum. And I, don't, I wouldn't be surprised if we, uh, in the next month or two or in the next year or so, hear about another outbreak in another district because this is very common. Any questions or issues about pertussis that anybody has? Okay. So thank you. And we will go to uh, Ridvik. You have a presentation on chemical safety, correct? Thanks. Uh, 
Um, so my presentation is about chemicals, primarily the health effects and then what we can do to be safer around them. <clears throat> so technically we are all made of chemicals, but the chemicals that I'm discussing are best explained by the definition above. In 2009, the American Chemical Society announced that 50 million different types of chemicals had been found or made in the world by humans. And then in America, a little more recent statistic, the 2013-2014 winter, 70,000 types of chemicals were being commercially produced in America. Now, we are in constant contact with chemicals every single day. Um, we are exposed to around 2,100,000 toxins each day. And below is a link with a pretty full list of all the chemicals and what they're used for in our everyday lives. Um, there are some chemicals which are completely beneficial and benevolent, but others are harmful or hazardous to our health. They present physical or health threats, and those are three examples below carcinogens, corrosives, and neurotoxins. Um, and then at the very bottom of the slide are three ex examples of extremely toxic, uh, toxic chemicals. The one in the middle, uh, organic chlorides, they were involved in the massive oil spill. I believe it was either the BP one or the Exxon Valdez. And um, they killed a lot of life there. And the middle of the link is all the different types of hazardous chemicals and more information about them. I'm not going to list all of these uh, bullet points, but because they're fairly obvious about the uh, storage, uh, you should always just keep it away from ignition sources and keep it organized. But I will mention labeling is extremely important. You should label the type of chemical, the name, um, what group it comes from, so is it combustible, corrosive, and then also what health hazards it might pose, such as toxicity. And this is important because there are certain chemicals which are incompatible with each other, which means if they mix, they can produce dangerous results. Um, that includes explosions or toxic gas. And so you want to keep these as far away from each other, and by labeling, you reduce the risk of accidentally mixing them. Um, this is so important that I would recommend looking at that link. Um, it has all the information about incompatible chemicals and what you should do. And then a fun fact, uh, did you know that keeping chemicals out of reach and sight of children could stop up to 75% of small child poisoning cases? Um, it's good for the public to know. So, as I said, for the labels, you should be reading both the labels you make and the labels on the container itself. Um, ensure that they are clearly labeled and that you don't mix up the names. And make sure that when you, before you buy them, that you're reading the labels because you don't want to not know how to use the chemical when you buy it. Make sure that it's not leaking and that you close it tightly after use. And while you're using it, there's always proper wear, depending on what type of chemical it is. Uh, make sure that the fumes can affect you so that it's well ventilated. Um, and do not return the, any unused material back into the container, dispose of it. When disposing of chemicals, there are two ways. The first is for non-hazardous chemicals. If it's liquid, you can be poured down the sink if it's a solid, then it can go in a closed container in the trash. However, if it is hazardous, or so if it is one of the, uh, what's it called, the definition below the, what it makes a chemical hazardous, then that means that it has to be taken to a collection site and it cannot be dumped anywhere inside or outside your house. And if you look at the labels on most containers, they'll say whether it's hazardous or how to properly dispose of it. This is a list of possible hazardous wastes and a link below for more information about them. <clears throat> so the collection program, there's one in Delaware County. It's called the Household Hazardous Waste Program. It runs 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. rain or shine. There are four dates a year. And um, it seems that the program is also joined with some of the other counties in the area so that if you can't make it to any of the ones this, um, for the Delaware County, 
you can go to those other places, and there's about 20 programs or days in which you can go. Um, but for Delaware County, there's one April 25th, which is coming up pretty soon. Um, and so if you can't make it to that one in time, then there's one Saturday, June 13th. Um, both are 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And if you want full information on what can be taken there and where it is, the location, as well as some other places where you can take other hazardous waste, then that's the codelaware.pa link. One thing that um, I think I should tell you is that there's no latex paint, medical, unidentified, or radioactive waste taken at the sites, but um, they provide information on how to get rid of latex paint and where to take the other stuff. Also, no appliances are taken, but at Best Buy and um, Lowe's, Home Depot, uh, Goodwill, they take certain things. That's also on the website. Best Buy takes TVs and computers. And then finally, um, if you can't make it to any of the 20 <laughs> uh, sites, then there are service suppliers throughout eastern Pennsylvania. So there are many harmful effects of chemicals on public health, and I think it's important that the public doesn't forget this because we are so used to using chemicals that we forget that they're not really normal in our everyday lives and we weren't really meant to handle them. So they can range from symptoms such as irritation of eyes or mouth to nerve and kidney damage. And chemicals can really affect almost every single system in your body. The more dangerous it is, the more likely that um, you should be taking extra precautions with it. And some chemicals are suspected carcinogens, which means that they're cancer-causing substances. For more information, there, the link is below. Another interesting thing is that Chemicals have been found to actually interact with um, allergens to create longer um, and more heavy immune responses or stronger allergies. Uh, ozone and nitrogen dioxide uh, interacted with the birch pollen allergen in a study, and it created the body to attack itself more and the allergies to worsen. Also, pollution does prolong the spring allergen season through global warming. So what to do when, uh, if you're in a situation where chemicals are acting dangerously? <clears throat> if there are chemicals in the eyes, you need to rinse out uh, for 15 to 20 minutes with water. And if you're wearing contacts, rinse for five minutes, remove, and then continue rinsing. Chemicals on the skin, you want to remove the wet clothes, but you don't want to pull them off. You should cut them off because you don't want to spread the chemicals onto the rest of your body, and then you rinse again. If someone has drunk chemicals, they should, if they... If they're not throwing up or uh, unconscious, they should be drinking half a glass of water. And poisonous gas, if it's inhaled, you need to get them to fresh air, open all the doors and windows, let the poisonous gas out. And then finally, if it's a hurry case with unconsciousness or if they're not breathing, you need to call 911. For all of these, you should call poison control. And you should understand that you don't want to become the victim yourself. So before you enter the scene, you should check to make sure that you're safe. In a township chemical emergency, you should follow the township instructions, stay inside, and try to close off any ways that outside air can make it inside, and go to a room without windows with emergency supplies. And finally, the poison control number is 1-800-222-1222. Now, chemicals also affect the environment as well as the public health. Neonicotinoids are probably the most famous argument going on right now concerning chemicals. Uh, they are, have been linked to killing bees, birds, and uh, other species, but most specifically the honeybee. In a problem called colony collapse disorder in which the bees leave the hive, become disoriented, can't find their way back, and then as more bees go out, the colony literally just goes silent and dies. The EPA has uh, recently started to ban permits on using the pesticide, and Lowe's has finally um, begun to curb its production. Household cleaners also release volatile organic compounds which contribute to smog and algae blooms in water, which causes pollution. <clears throat> and finally, uh, chemicals destroy the quality of our soil and food. 
Fertilizer, when placed on soil, literally kills the soil because it doesn't allow any new nutrients to form. And so farmers have to continue to put new fertilizer on instead of letting the soil itself regrow. And it's also found that trace minerals are destroyed in fruits and vegetables uh, between 1940 and 1991 because of chemicals. Silent Spring is an excellent uh, example of chemicals affecting our environment. Uh, DDT and organophosphates were used wild, widely, and I think it's important to understand that at that time, everyone was convinced that DDT was not a dangerous substance, and so we have to understand that the chemicals we're using today might really be the next DDT, we just don't know it. And what they would do is they uh, thin the eggshell of birds so that once the birds sat on the eggshell, it would squash underneath them, and this nearly wiped out the bald eagle. Um, and those are two interesting statistics. Finally, so now that we know that chemicals can be dangerous, how can we live a chemical-free lifestyle? There are non-toxic home cleaning methods and non-chemical uh, substitutes that you can use, which are in that link, as well as those household ideas. And to finish it off, out in the garden, Instead of using fertilizer, you can use composted manure or leaf mulch and test the soil so that you know what you, should, what you need to do. <clears throat> Instead of pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, you should take care of your plants by not uh, inducing them on undue stress, such as not watering during the heat of the day or in the evening, not mowing too short, um, and then for pests, just pick them off and destroy as many as possible. There are also planting methods in which you can reduce the number of pests which will appear in your garden, as well as plants which will deter harmful insects and bring beneficial ones. Thank you. Great stuff, thank you. I mean, obviously a lot of research and, and interest in a topic that you're interested in, obviously, right? Yeah. That's great stuff, thank you very much. That was excellent, thank you very much. And the other thing I just wanted to mention was um, we all have a lot of medications in our homes and um, I know we Larry's talked about different times we can dispose of the medications, but remember flushing them down the toilet, the sink, that sort of thing goes into the streams and the environment as well. So it's really important to properly dispose of um, medications. We do have our drop box here at the Radnor Township building. Anytime. Dr. Dr. Foreman, could you just comment on the safest place to keep your chemicals from children being, I think, a point that Ridvik made, being children are usually the victims of these types of uh, problems, and wh where should, where should uh, parents keep these chemicals and how should we store them? Well, I think that the, 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 the thing I hear the most uh, in pediatrics about chemicals are, are in the spring and the summer from garages. And that's where we keep a lot of the bug sprays and the, and the uh, herbicides and other things that, are, uh, that can be pretty toxic to children. Um, so I think an important point for parents would be finding a way to get them high out of the reach of kids. Uh, and also the great, uh, the great um, tip about labeling, um, unfortunately, this is the story that you hear all the time, there was a, a school in India that, that uh, oil for cooking was mixed, uh, was next to a, 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 a bottle of some pesticide, and that ended up going into some lentils that were served to children, and they unfortunately got very ill and, and, and some passed. So labeling them, of course, keeping them separate from each other if they're, obviously, if they're household chemicals versus cooking things, and keeping things up and away from um, children's reach is really the best way to go. Uh, but wow, it's a great presentation. Thank you very much, Rick. I appreciate it. Right. Uh, and then last of new business, we'll go, um, we'll talk about the wellness committee. Um, Kevin, do you have a, a minute to just give us a little update on what that is? I can't compete with the presentations, but I'll give you just a little uh, overview of what we're doing at the school district. So the school district is required to have a wellness policy, which is our policy 272. Uh, and we are also uh, required to review that policy. So we're having an ad hoc committee that's going to be meeting over uh, two months, uh, one meeting this week uh, on April 23rd, another meeting in May, uh, to review our current policy, 
uh, in particular in response to the Healthy and Hungry, Hungry, Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010. Uh, so uh, because we receive federal funds for our uh, free and reduced lunch program, which we have uh, for our students uh, with low income, uh, and in addition to our uh, breakfast program, uh, we're required to meet certain uh, regulations uh, in regards to our, our food services uh, program and our, and our wellness policy. So anytime a law changes, we know they uh, promulgate regulations. So we have the federal regulations uh, which came forth and we started implementing them uh, upon uh, receipt. Uh, that included some changes to our, uh, our offerings at lunch and the, the healthy snacks that we now offer. Uh, which impacts some fundraising. It, there's different time frames that you can do fundraising uh, in regards to uh, selling snacks. Uh, but now what we're taking a look at is the actual policy. Uh, we, although Pennsylvania has not uh, disseminated their regulations yet, we do have the federal uh, regulations that we're going to be taking a look at. Uh, so we're going to be doing a uh, sort of a, a needs assessment, where, where our policy currently is, uh, where we anticipate it going, uh, based off of the federal guidelines, uh, in hopes of uh, quickly making a recommendation to our policy committee. Uh, it was, uh, in school districts, there we have a lot of policies. Uh, this policy, uh, you know, frankly, we don't have a lot of leeway in implementing. So once we get the information from the uh, State Department of Health, uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, to go forward and, and, and uh, make some changes to our policy. So we have, you know, several, we have some members of the community. We invited members of, of the Board of Health uh, if they were interested. Uh, we have uh, some students, some teachers involved with the committee. So we're going to be doing an analysis of what we currently have uh, and, in, uh, and a review of what we anticipate the new changes uh, coming from the, the Department of Health. Uh, unfortunately, the regulations were supposed, we were told the regulations were coming out in May. Now we heard they're pushed back till uh, the summer. Uh, summer is a tough time to get things done in a school district, so we're trying to get the stuff done, uh, get the hard work and the heavy lifting done uh, in April and May. Uh, so hopefully, uh, early September, I'll have a report that I can provide to the board uh, regarding where we are with that. Thank you for that, Kevin. I believe I missed one thing in old business I wanted to speak of real quick. Um, Dr. Leader, do you have anything further on the, the dining in, in with dogs thing? I think there was a couple of updates through the month about this. Uh, Joan and I had some back and forth with our most interested um, township resident. Um, I can give a quick update on mine and then you can as well too. So I had contacted one of the food inspectors in Philadelphia um, and he was kind enough to reply saying that they currently um, follow the Pennsylvania State Code that they do not allow dogs in outdoor dining situations. Um, I forwarded him one of the websites that's promoting Philadelphia dog dining and uh, I, I did not hear back from him about that. So um, currently I think on the books, uh, Philadelphia, which I was hoping might be leading an initiative because of the publication and promotion, um, is apparently not right now. Um, and I think you are looking elsewhere as well. You all enjoyed my picture of the dog in Matty Unk, <laughs> happily eating right by a table uh, or with its owners eating. Um, you know what I had suggested, and I'm not sure if um, Mark Pomeroy had, had a chance to do this, the resident, um, contacting an epidemiologist, Dr. Gary Smith, at uh, Penn Vet at New Bolton Center, who would you know, be a, a, a great person to, you know, address this issue of the actual reality of, of the risks and if this is something that, you know, is worth pursuing with the state. My impression is that the risks of dogs in a, with outdoor dining is extremely low. And, uh, and this is kind of sums up the point that the risks uh, of infection, of contaminating food are, are much greater in the kitchen from, um, from the people preparing the food than, than from dogs. So. Great, thank you. And we'll, we'll just continue to be up to, uh, get up to date on anything that comes up. I, I think we, there, an email came late in the week uh, from Mr. Pomeroy that said he was contacting some people from the state to, just to discuss this even further, which is great. And I, so I think he was also gonna yeah. be um, contacting uh, Senator Dalen Leach, who was 
sort of all over a lot of animal um, welfare, animal relationship type issues unrelated to this. So he, he might look into that as well. Curious to see where it goes. Thank you. Uh, and, and just uh, we'll go to announcements from here. I just to let everybody know that May is Autism Awareness Month. Uh, autism being a disorder of social uh, communication and has a, a wide spectrum of how it presents and uh, how severe it is, but it's uh, excellent uh, to read about and understand uh, so we can all um, help out uh, with, um, with a problem that's uh, obviously gets a lot of media attention. Any other announcements anybody else has in the community for the next month prior to the next meeting? Nothing. Any public participation today? All right. Sarah Pilling from Garrett Hill and intimately involved in the Skunk Hollow Community Garden. Um, as you may or may not know, the license for the farmer at our Drossen to use parkland, our land that we're paying for, did come up. And um, I sort of got my nose under the tent on this and realized that the Board of Commissioners had four votes that the farmer could do almost anything he wanted because it would mean keeping the cows in Radnor. Um, the net result was that he got his license. Uh, one limitation in the license, whereas the state had required him not to spray within 25 feet of a stream, it's now 100 feet because the Little Darby Creek is at the bottom of that field. And what I find interesting is that the township is, and it sounds auxiliary, but it's not. The township is not allowed to rebuild the entrance bridge to the Willows until the American eel, which transforms itself into a freshwater fish and looks like a leaf, is done with its migration. The eel lives in the Sarcasso Sea. They spawn. The American eels go west and the European eels go east. How they don't mix up, I don't know. And they come up the rivers, freshwater rivers, in the United States, in Virginia, in up the Delaware, so they're up the Pennypack, the Darby, the Wissahickon, any of the creeks that go up. When they get into those creeks, they transform from a saltwater fish to a freshwater fish. And so this bridge cannot be rebuilt, uh, so says the DEP, until after these funny-looking little translucent fish have come up Nobody knows how far and then gone back again. So this is the field, this is the stream that the farmer's uh, chemicals will be using. We were not able to determine that he used, well, one of the chemicals he used was very toxic. And he admitted he did use glyphosates, but not very often. So I said to him, please make your not very often even less often. I think what it did was make people aware that this is going on. And um, hopefully, uh, he will become more and more cautious because of a path, whoops, a path is going to go right through the quarry field. And so there was some discussion about you won't be able to spray anywhere near the path. And so I think this is a diminishing issue from our point of view. I think he's going to become pretty discouraged pretty fast. He, my sense was he wasn't really happy that people were going to start watching him. And um, so hopefully we can talk him away for it, from it. Um, at that meeting, a woman I didn't know, she's a friend of Judy Sherry's, sort of came out of left field. She's very much of an anti-GMO person because he does use GMO corn, and he was using GMO soybeans, but apparently the deer really did in his soybean harvest. Uh, so she was out like thunder, so I sort of sat back and thought, well, I really don't need to say anything because this woman is saying it. So that's the update. On the other side, it was very thrilling for me, and you might like to know, I was up at the garden on Monday, and I happened to turn towards the grove of trees in Skunk Hollow, and there from right to left, gliding, came a bald eagle. And I'll tell you, it is quite something to see. He was just lazing along, and uh, it was really very exciting. Another piece of information I think is very interesting is the 
Montgomery County, Maryland, is working to ban the use of all lawn pesticides. And they're coming along in their work. And uh, also in Barnegat Bay, which you may or may not know, they're not allowed to use fertilizers on their lawns within 75 feet of the bay because the nitrogen level of the bay is unbelievable and a really toxic jellyfish is beginning to show in the upper reaches of the bay. And apparently when it stings you, it's very much like a man of war. You're, you're really in trouble. So communities are moving to be using less and less pesticides and herbicides, and that's certainly a direction I'd like to see Radnor Township go in. I heard a very discouraging story from one of my neighbors last week who's now joined us up at Skunk Hollow that his neighbor says she can't lean over to pull weeds, so she just kills them with a chemical. And I'm thinking, oh my God. So I think we could do some sort of an educational process to begin people to become aware of what they're using so they can make a choice rather than just buying it. I know I used to be with Cooperative Extension and although I didn't man the phones, I sat there and listened to it and if one teaspoon, teaspoonful of chemical was what was recommended. They would ask if they couldn't use a quart. So people don't know, and the people in the stores don't necessarily know to guide them. So I feel like we're getting someplace with the chemicals and the cows. At least, hopefully, more people are becoming aware. Thank you. Sarah, I have three questions. What do we know about um, where those chemicals the farmer is storing those chemicals, and if they're um, secure? He uses a firm by the name of CropMark to do all his spraying. He does not spray. Okay, so they're not stored in the township. No, they're, contract, they're contracted out to whatever the, this company's name is, CropMark. There's an alternative um, process where Insect, and I know Villanova University does it very well, and Haverford College is just getting into it, where insects are used, I can't remember the name of, of it, where insects are used to compete with other insects. Mm -hmm. um, now, that can't be done with herbicides. Beneficial but, insects, but, yes. Yeah, and I wonder if, if that's something that he's looked into or that the township has looked into. Uh, the impression I got just from me, was that he was not open to new ideas. He said he'd been a farmer for 25 years and his father had been a farmer for 50 years before. The GMO woman offered to pay for him to go to the Rodale Institute to learn more sustainable agriculture. He was not interested. What the township is getting out of this, which I didn't know, because he's, he's paying a dollar for this license is he's doing all the weed whacking along Darby Paoli Road as far as our Drossen goes, and he's maintaining the post and rail fence. So that's what the township's getting. And of course, the cows, by eating the field and him growing hay and then haying it, it keeps those fields in better condition than if the township had to go out there. And I don't think the public would ever allow grass to grow to the height that you need to for hay unless it had a purpose. So that seems to be the quid pro quo. Okay, and my, my last question is, do we know if the bald eagle is part of a pair and if it's nesting and where? I do know where it's nesting, but if we put it out in the public, someone might go and bother the eagle. So yes, it is nesting in Radnor Township. I'm just wondering if it if and it where has it's a nest. Is, has Did, has it raised an eaglet? Anything. I don't know okay. that. Okay. So interestingly, uh, there's a website I'm watching every day and all the time. It's the bald eagle cam up in Hanover, Pennsylvania, and there's two babies in the nest. So it's been fascinating to see the mother and the father yeah. Yeah. raise these two babies. I just know there is a nest, but I, I'm not going to go there because I think if this is the season that they're raising their young, this is the season when they should be left alone. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your input. Appreciate it. Um, and that uh, is the end of public participation. We will adjourn this meeting and meet, meet again on May 18th, 2015 for the Board of Health meeting in May. Thank you. <laughs>